everyone. Welcome to the Smart Economy Podcast, a production of neonewstoday.com. I'm your host, Dylan Grabowski. In this episode of the Smart Economy Podcast, I sat down and spoke with Brandon Sullivan, the Chief Product Officer at Dococo. Dococo is a consulting firm that builds tools for decentralized autonomous organizations. In 2020, the team released Alien Worlds, an open metaverse land mining game that incorporates NFTs and DAOs. The team cites, it is the first project to put DAOs into direct competition with one another within a single economy. In this conversation, Brendan and I talk about how his professional journey through tech and product management led to building DAO technology at Dococo, the democratization of content and information, how DAOs require people to be successful, the various use cases for DAOs, the grants the team has available for builders to create in the alien world's ecosystem, and so much more. Just a reminder, nothing said on this podcast is a solicitation to buy or sell any tokens, that nothing should be taken as financial advice, and that the host or guests may hold tokens discussed in any given episode. With that said, I really enjoyed chatting with Brendan, and I hope you enjoy the conversation too. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Smart Economy Podcast. Today, we are joined by Brendan Sullivan, the Chief Product Officer at DeCoco. How are you doing today, Brendan? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing really well. Uh, We were just kind of talking before we got recording that uh, I was at ETH Denver and one of your colleagues was at ETH Denver. And they were just kind of there to get a sense of what was going on at the conference. So maybe before we jump into you, your background, a lot of the cool things you're working on at DeCoco and Alien Worlds, did your coworker, did your peer share any interesting insights about ETH Denver, maybe about their perspective on gaming and the blockchain space or anything like that? We haven't debriefed. And so when I talked to him a couple of days ago, he was talking about new conspiracy theories, which we probably shouldn't get into, but apparently there are a lot going around ETH Denver. and. Um, We were talking about, you know, stable coins and who's controlling them and that kind of thing. So (laughs) I was, he wasn't sure what to make of it. And I wasn't sure what to make of him telling me about it. So (laughs) it sounded like it was a good collection of people. Yeah, that's one of the things that I love about the space is that there's really cool, transparent, immutable technology. And then there's also the fringe and everybody who is kind of fed up with the way that things are currently operated. So maybe they have some unique ideas. Yeah, it's it's really fun. I've never been in a market where there's so many people like that that are, they have kind of stepped away from the easiest way of doing things, of building businesses, of transferring value, of making a value proposition, and rejected that in favor of doing something new. And that's, it takes a different set of people, right? The personalities come along with it. And I find it really invigorating for me personally. But you do definitely hear a lot of stories and people get worried about things that some of them turn out to be true, some of them not. And it's um, it's a great space. Yeah, it reminds me of two sayings. Uh, Broken clock is right twice a day. And uh, <laughs> there's also a, a Nirvana saying from Kurt, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you. That's right. <laughs> so you mentioned that this is kind of an interesting market for you to be participating in. And you have a diverse background in IT and research analytics. So before we kind of delve into everything, could you just give us an overview of the worlds you were working in before you came into the blockchain and gaming and Web3 space? I'll give it a shot. I started out in humanities, not in technology. I went to journalism school. And when I got out of school, I joined a publishing company, like a pharmaceutical publishing company as an editor. So it's this very low level guy that's, you know, editing technical monographs about how drugs interact. And I became interested in our publishing system. I'd never been that into technology, but when I saw how it worked and started working on it and doing some testing on it, this is how, how content is marked up, how it's stored, how it's delivered for different different products that that, that company had. I became really interested. And so I started, you know, 
got my own computer and I was working on, well, I had a computer and I started working, building some software projects on it. And I got a job. I went from there to a tech writing job for the Department of Defense. Well, well not the, the DOD, like a contractor, a big contractor. Okay. And um, I started building stuff right away. We were building stuff for the Army Reserves and a different personnel command stuff. And I loved it. I was building a lot of training applications, a lot of websites and things like that. I uh, did a short stint for a year at a big car rental company. And then I went back to publishing to work on digital transformation projects. And this was, again, a little higher level job doing big software projects to take all of this content that they had. And this was in um, nursing academic publishing. So they had tons and tons of content. And how do you turn that into apps and websites and online learning? And I uh, was there for quite a while. And that's where I learned, you know, agile, lean methodologies, you know, how to build successful projects. I, I got into UX and interviewing customers. And, you know, customer intimacy was kind of a new thing. It was, you know, everybody in tech was like, you build it and they will come. And UX in interviewing methodologies and were very innovative at the time. And I just loved it. And I still do. It's, it's still a big thing that I believe in that you got to get really close to your customers to really know what problems they're going to solve. And they don't often care about how cool something you're building is unless it solves a problem for them. By the time I left that company, I had an MBA and I was a product manager. So I went, you know, through programmer, project manager, different business type jobs and landed in product management. And I, then I went into uh, the marketing space, building big marketing apps for pharmaceutical companies, uh, hotel chains, automotive companies, you know, big campaigns, loyalty campaigns, incentive campaigns and solutions. At that job, I, uh, had a lot of different roles. I was the head of innovation. And I worked with startups through, through a partnership we had with Capital Innovators, which is an incubator here in St. Louis, Missouri, and coaching startups and doing a lot with business model innovation. That's where I, I did a ton of business cases. So I really cut my teeth on finding how we're going to create value, who's, who are we creating it for, and how we're going to pay for it. <laughs> And if we can do it for a profit, and that, the company had a lot of different businesses. So it was really a challenge to juggle all of those. It's a lot easier if you have one business model than five or six. And the, uh, we had SaaS products and consulting services and a lot of different, you know, kind of hybrid technology solutions, creative services. So all of those have a different business model. And I kind of enjoyed trying to figure out how to optimize each of those. I was doing that at that incentive company. A little over a year ago, I was working on in the EV space or the, uh, in the automotive sector, kind of trying to connect car companies to dealerships to utility companies. Mm -hmm. I had a product that did that, and I was using AI to sort of slurp in all of this paperwork that you, you hand over when you buy an EV. And we, would, um, we were using AI to, to, to read all of it and see if the name on the driver's license was the name of the title, which was the same as the name of the person that bought the car to see if we could save some money on the kind of the human auditing of the back end of that system. I was building that product and a friend called me up and asked me if I could uh, talk to these people that he was working for in the crypto space about product. And I love product management. It's who I am. It's what I do. And um, I'm always up for that. And that's how I met the DeCoco team and um, got converted. Really cool background. Uh, there are a few kind of lines that I want to touch on there. You got your start in the medical space coming from a journalism perspective. So I'm curious, and maybe this is grasping for straws, but having paywalls behind medical journals can kind of be disheartening when there's so much information out there and there are large swaths of the world that can't gain access to these medical titles and journals. So I'm wondering if maybe some of these issues that you saw in like a larger bureaucratic sort of field pushed you into the startup space, into the product management space. I'm wondering if there's any relationship there with wanting to be kind of on the ground with something that you could really get your hands on and, and maybe make more of an impact with. That's a great question. And, and in medical publishing, that is a big problem. The paywalls kind of prevent 
new procedures and methodologies to get out to everybody. And the publishers will defend that. The state of publishing books is very expensive. Paying editors like I was, not very much, but paying them nonetheless, you know, requires those library, uh, you know, I, I guess you buy a monthly license or you got so many seats per license at the different school. And they justifiably get a lot of uh, a flack for kind of protecting that content. I do think that the blockchain kind of licensing models and the new innovations that we see coming forward, is it, it'll be... Um, it offers innovation and democratization of content and insights and research results. I think authors are frustrated with publishers, but, you know, publishing in general is being challenged, I think, and I'm not in this space anymore, but still being being challenged to prove their worth in, in a world that doesn't need their infrastructure so much. For, there's so much we can do on our own. Yeah, really cool. Thanks for, for your insights. And then um, secondly, another addition to your original response is um, you were building out this AI service that would scan through documents and look for particular names. The first quarter of 2023 has been kind of an explosion of natural language processing, AI, chatbots. Uh, it's kind of years of development that kind of exploded all at once. So what is your perspective on the current status of these AI generated chatbots, is this along the lines of where you thought AI would be right now based off of your experience working in your previous company? What's your general insights into how AI is being released into the world right now? Well, like everybody else, I mean, ChatGPT is incredible. Like the first time I used it, my mind was blown. So like, I, I don't know of anybody that, you know, isn't freaked at how cool that is. And, and it's, it's, I think it's great that um, it's disruptive, you know, that it wasn't a big fang company that brought it forward. I like that a lot. And I think everybody kind of likes that a bit. We see some change in the control of who has this technology a little bit. For me, it was a revelation because when I was building products with AI, you know, just 15 months ago, it was really like a below the scenes service, right? It was things we're doing to kind of like, do a lot of churning through data to help us do back-end decision-making, to make it so customer-friendly, so usable is revelation. You know, when on the project I was using, you know, we got, there was a lot of statistics involved, a lot of testing. It was hard to use. It was hard for me to wrap my head around a lot of engineering, but to see such a great product come out of it so quickly after that, just like everybody else, I'm just amazed. And, and I like the art. We use it, you know, it's incredible for pattern recognition. It just does things that you can't do manually. You can't program for machine learning. Is, um, it's going to make a lot of things possible because a lot of expensive, hard to do things will get easier. Yeah, one of the kind of dystopian conversations that came out of ETH Denver for me personally was chatting with someone who said that the future of the internet is going to rely on identity standards, because in a few years, we're not going to be able to tell if information is real or not, and if it was written by a human or by an AI bot. So we're definitely at an inflection point right now. We are, but you have to embrace change. You, know, you have to embrace innovation and, and things change. So like, if you hold on to, if you try to stop it, you're going to lose. And I think everybody kind of knows that, at least in our, in our space, right? So what does it mean? We have to come up, we have to innovate in terms of authenticity, find different ways to figure out the credibility of somebody in our space, in the DAO space. That's really important because, you know, crypto wallet is anonymous. So there's different methodologies that teams are using to, I was in a meeting 90 minutes ago, we were talking about this, um, to verify the um, reputation of somebody participating in a game, in a space, in a DAO. You don't know their name and address and, and social security number, but there are different ways you can look at what they've done on chain. And they're, it's a different kind of fingerprint, but it's still a fingerprint. And, and um, malicious actors leave fingerprints, and so do good actors. And so um, as building new, you know, trust will mean something different than an eye, you know, a handshake was what it used to be. Eye contact is what it used to be. Owning my PII is what it is now. In the future, it could be 
machine learning can help us look at the behavior of somebody over time on chain and determine the probability of them being a good actor or a bad actor. And that's happening right now in our space. So I think we'll innovate our way. We can stay in front of the dystopian reality. I mean, the thing about, you know, Ready Player One wasn't that they built this sort of simulated universe. It was that it was so much better than the universe that people lived in. And that's that's the creepy part for me. It's not that I can't tell from a fake person, you know, it's that it'll be better than my actual life. (laughs) That's where I need to be careful. (laughs) I'm excited to talk about some technologies like zero knowledge proofs and maybe reputation badges and things like this when it comes to DAOs, Mm -hmm. but kind of like sticking on this theme of innovation. I'm curious to hear what were your insights the first time you heard about blockchain, crypto, Bitcoin, Ethereum? When was the first time you heard about this? And did you just kind of like glaze over and, and look past it? Or or what were your kind of initial insights? Well, I'm not somebody that, you know, read Satoshi's white paper and just got the religion. I was reading about it in the press, like with everybody else from Wired and Fast Company. And it seemed, you know, this sort of peer-to-peer financial exchange. I understood pretty quickly the desire to not have banks or governments involved in the exchange of value. I think that's sort of uh, clearly a compelling use case that that they're not necessarily trustworthy, but we have to put our trust in them in order to live in the world. And the fact that they can have agendas that are not consistent with our own, that made total sense to me. Took me a long time to figure out places to apply it, but I sort of tracked it. I didn't didn't really get involved. I didn't buy early or anything like that. I I saw the reputation sour, like where, you know, it went super duper right wing whack job. And then it went, you know, (laughs) grifter just in the last few years when the NFT explosions happened, then it got absolutely absurd. And so I was was mostly an observer for that, but I had at different times checked in on the development of blockchain tech for different products I was working on to make business. So like, Blockchain tech has got a big role to play, I think, in marketing applications and loyalty applications where you have a lot of data. Security is very important. And you want to have a portable currency. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's crypto, right? And you, that's every loyalty application that you're, you have now could probably be built more securely and more cheaply on a shared crypto architecture. So it's a currency, your airline miles are a currency. The points you accrue at your grocery store are a currency. You know, the obviously Starbucks is doing an amazing job already with their loyalty program. Employee recognition systems, very much so. That's putting currency back and forth. And obviously, every incentive program that, happens, that a Salesforce does, you know, that's a currency. So you, you got tracking data, tracking transactions, distributing currency. That's crypto. And it, it's really hard too. Like in your last, it might have been your last guy, Saqib Wasim. Mm-hmm. He was talking about the incredible costs that banks go through to build up all the, this infrastructure. A loyalty platform does most of the stuff that a bank does, but it has to get stood up at the pace of market. So like these things stand up like tens and tens of thousands of people in really quick. Tons of money is being handled, tens of thousands of transactions, but you don't have all the time a bank has to stand up their thing. These things are spun up and spun down rapidly. You know, as your bank card changes loyalty providers, you get a new card in the mail. That's a whole new banking system that you've just gotten. A lot of that expense and work and risk could be offloaded to the chain. I think it's inevitable. I think it will be. Five years ago, when I was looking into it, there's already um, some blockchain companies are in the loyalty space and they're doing fine. There are some barriers, like people don't have crypto wallets. Right. <laughs> right. Until we get mass adoption, you know, an airline can't just tell you to go download Anchor or something else or you know, create a Coinbase account. So they got to figure that piece out. Sometimes they like to have points instead of fungible currency because they they want you to spend your earnings on in-kind rewards. Right. So or they don't want you to spend your earnings on, you know, whatever. So. But those are just implementation details. I think given the cost that um, and the risk, that's really not added value given what blockchain can do. And 
the loyalty program should be a creative thing that really inspires people, connects them to your brand. And so much of the money is wasted on the technology that doesn't need to be. I've been in the crypto space since 2017. And that's kind of one of the things that has blown my mind that has not taken off yet is these tokenized royalty rewards, even secondary markets for me to be able to swap my target points for Starbucks points. Right. But you you bring up a lot of really good issues. Uh, there's not mainstream adoption. So we don't have like my mom downloading a wallet yet. Yeah. And also we just, you know, Starbucks might not want their points to leave their ecosystem, so to say. So maybe that's kind of like a, like a corporate sort of a hang up right now. I'm hoping that blockchain and crypto networks can kind of help make folks realize that if there's a little bit of, uh, for lack of a better term, liquidity between rewards points for different companies, that maybe there's uh, some positive externalities that can come from that. So do you at DeCoco feel that you're more focused on DAOs or are you more focused on the gaming industry right now? That's a great question. We started as our founders of DAO people, DAO architects, DAO visionaries, you know, DAO strategists, but also they love games, very creative people. So DAOs are a creative solution to a problem, in my opinion. The games are mostly reference games. Like one thing that you need, but we're in the business of innovating in the DAO space or creating communities, trustless communities, you know, that enable people that want to be leaders that want to create culture to get together in a trustless environment and make shared decisions and allocate resources. To do that, you need people. One problem in the DAO tech space is that there's not enough people in the space to really test and scale the market. Like it's, it's really an exclusive, it's a management tool, right? So like DAOs are how you manage something else. It's not for a lot of users. What gaming does is it enables us to bring in users. And um, pay-to-earn gaming enables us to bring in many users, right? So that's how the two go together. With that said, we love gaming. When we started you know, building up, the people, our early adopters, a lot of them joined the company. It's a lot of fun. It makes the job a lot of fun. And it brings in, importantly, that community of people that really care about the brand, really care about the, the game, and want to be involved. So that's core for the community. The DAO is a container technology without any kind of context. It doesn't work. It's about people and DeCoco and Alien World is about people in the community. So that gives us the people and the problem to solve and the mission and the shared goals and objectives that's needed to give the, a DAO the right context to work in. Yeah. And also, it was really fun digging into DeCoco. The company has roots in the old uh, EOS ecosystem and was born out of uh, EOS DAC. So it's really refreshing to kind of see a group of people who've been in the space for five, six plus years now, continuing to build and also grow, bringing you into the fold from an external industry. So that's really exciting. So you're focusing right now on alien worlds. So I'm wondering, this is kind of an awkward question. Why is the gaming industry so negative on blockchain technologies and things like NFTs? It would seem to me that this is kind of like the perfect mesh of having like in-game items, in-game worlds, in-game plots, and being able to own them as a token and then be able to sell them on secondary markets. So I'm curious, like, why is there a disconnect with gamers and this new kind of activation that the technology offers them in order to be able to own and maybe even buy or sell goods? That's a great question. And I, and I should have thought about that a lot more ahead of time. You know, and I should know <laughs> that because I know that to be the case that they really can't stand, you know, NFT assets. And, and it, it, there's a big pushback in traditional AAA and mid-core games on blockchain tech and NFT rewards. So I would say you could be, let's, you can go back to our ETH Denver and say it's a conspiracy. So like, who's it, <laughs> whose interest, right, is it? that blockchain games are not adopted. <laughs> so you, you could be, but uh, I think it's a difference in usability. If your expectation for a game, right, is Red Dead Redemption 2 on the Xbox, or like you're flying through space, you know, 
You can't do that on chain. Right. You can't. You, you can't have that immersive an experience. So maybe it's that. Maybe for those hardcore first person shooter games or, you know, simulators and everything else, maybe they just don't want to take a step backwards in terms of the the speed and the interactive experience that you can have. And I get that. So I understand that, but I, I don't know if, I mean, gaming is such a broad, such a broad industry, you know, in that corner of it, I don't get why there's so much pushback on NFTs in the crypto space. Maybe it's because of crypto's reputation. It could, it could just be that. Yeah, really cool. It's an unanswerable question from my perspective, but I also remember before I bought my first NFT two years ago now, two and a half years ago, I did not get it at all. I didn't buy in and I'm a crypto native. So I can see how it could take a while for some people to come around. Now, I want to talk a little bit about DeCoco. We talked about the background of the company coming from the EO space and really building decentralized autonomous communities. So what is the focus of DeCoco now? It seems like Alien Worlds is the company's premier product, but you also talked about DAO solutions. So that leads me to believe that DeCoco isn't just focusing on building a game, but maybe that there's other realms as well that the company would like to tap into. So beyond Alien Worlds, which I can't wait to dig into, what are some other focus areas that you and your peers at Tococo spend your days digging into? To answer that question, like I'll let you know that Alien Worlds is the test bed for our DAO strategies, right? So we, we brought in all of these game players in order to test out, to push the limits of what DAOs can do with an audience. So we're, it is our lab, you know, it is where we're we're innovating for our DAO, our DAO tech. And so we're we're learning there. There's a lot we could do that we're, we're thinking about doing in terms of taking the learnings from in the game and applying them to, you know, as it could be new products or services in the gaming industry, outside the gaming industry. We're doing, you know, what we're doing in the DAOs in the game is pretty much the cutting edge. And so the founders came up with this design, which was really ingenious. It's been durable. It's enabled us to do quite a bit in terms of building games and building these communities on top of it. But this was the goal: is to push forward the um, push the envelope on what DAOs can do and to help prove the use case for them in the broader market. Gaming is perfect for that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, gaming's perfect because you have people who already have an inherent interest in the participation of a game, the direction of the game, because they're playing it. DAOs to me have always been really interesting, but governance is something that people just aren't interested in. Dating back to 2016, only half of the United States voted <laughs> and everyone who didn't vote for number 45 was very upset. But, you know, did you actually participate in this governance process? So it's really hard to get people interested in reading and developing an opinion and then participating. Uh, so it's really cool that you guys are digging into building out this suite of tools using Alien Worlds. Before we dig into the game, what are some other use cases or verticals or industries or realms in which you think that DAOs will be integrated into those sort of decision-making processes maybe in the short term? Because it can be really hard to tell right now. It seems to me that Gaming is is a really good use case for DAOs, but what are some other areas that you think are should be on our radar to kind of like keep our ears to the ground and and really see how this technology is going to be integrated into? That's a great question. So in like adjacent markets or like so we have the Coco right here and what's right next door to us. You know, all the crypto companies generally need a decentralization you know roadmap. DAOs are, are essential for decentralization. If you're going to hand over the management of your company to you know, a decentralized organization, a DAO is going to come in very handy for that. So um, crypto companies, crypto games could use it for decentralization, theoretically. Any Another crypto game that doesn't have, that wants to organize their in-game communities and give them more 
autonomy, give them more authority over the management of their assets. That's a possibility where we could partner or provide services to another blockchain game. Then you can think about natural kind of types of organizations that could use a trustless structure like a DAO. Nonprofits come to mind, mm -hmm. which is pretty good where you know money comes in and there's people that are trusted to allocate the money in a transparent way. Transparency would make nonprofits a lot better because it, it's <laughs> there are uh, famously places for expensive dinners and fun trips, <laughs> you know, and eventually, you know, the charity happens, you know, so they, they bring a lot of transparency to the nonprofit space. I like the idea of pop-up DAOs where there's a temporary need for people to get together that don't know each other in a trust environment to make decisions, distribute resources, and then that's it. That's a really interesting use case that we've been looking at for, for the last few months. One thing with DAOs is a lot of times people that come together don't need to stay together forever in perpetuity, like a company, right? So the easiest way to think of a DAO is like, it does what um, a leadership team or a board does at a company, but the uh, you know all of the decisions are on chain and the lawyer is replaced with a smart contract. So, so you know, that's that's kind of like what it does, you know, but it's kind of this ring around you know a decision-making process that's a little bit simplistic. Ultimately, it's very nascent, you know, and, and that's why the gaming test bed is so helpful because we can start to see how these cultures are formed. It isn't that we know exactly how it's going to happen. If we're putting this out there and watching how it behaves in the context of a community. One thing we do to keep the energy up in alien worlds is we have new elections every week and we have six different DAOs. The DAOs compete. So you have all of these elections and competitions going on all the time. So we keep it turning over. And uh, in-game competition gives you a lot of energy that you're not going to have otherwise. If I just had this container, this Dow Tech, and I was going out in the market trying to sell it, it would be harder at this stage of the industry. Mm -hmm. My first job out of college was fundraising for a charity. Mm -hmm. And the lack of transparency was hands down one of the biggest reasons why people would always give us an excuse not to donate. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's a really interesting use case that you're you're bringing up. Also, I'm kind of fascinated about the six different DAOs. So before we let's take a step back and just talk about what Alien Worlds is. Is it a desktop application? Is it a mobile game? Uh, how can users interact with the game? And maybe if you could just give us like a quick little elevator pitch of what it is so that we could dig a little deeper. Okay, this is exciting. It's a browser-based game. It's all you know, JavaScript and React with some smart contracts on the back end. It looks very beautiful. You come in, you create your account, um, which includes creating an account on the, the Wax Cloud Wallet, which is the chain we're on. You enter the game. It's a play-to-earn game. You pick a planet. There's six different planets to choose from. You go to a planet and you can mine on that planet for Trillium. The tri trillium is the in-game token. That's our token for Alien Worlds. You, you mine for Trillium you, using a tool that's an NFT on land that's an NFT. And then, you know, you as you get Trillium, you can upgrade your tooling. You can buy land yourself. And as you accrue resources over, over playing the game, you can actually run or counsel on one of the planetary DAOs. So it's just the same way as you pick a planet to go mine, you can run for counsel on any of the six planetary DAOs. We call them syndicates in the game to make it more cool than DAO. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we call, you, you run for syndicate, we include stake-weighted voting, which means that you start with, you, you want to vote for, there's an election every week, so you're going to vote for a, a candidate. If you put more Trillium in, your vote is stronger. And then if you stake it, so there's different ways for us to offset the income inequality that's inherent in the game and in any economy. Some people have a lot of Trillium. Some people have a little Trillium. If you want more voting power, you can stake your little Trillium for longer. And that kind of balances things out. And those are some of the learnings we got from our founders being in the EO stack, right? So we've done this a couple of times, and some of those mechanisms are something that you know are hard-earned learnings, you know, you know, these kind of economics and, and how things behave. 
So we have these elections every month. That's the Dow game, you know, the, the governance game. We've got the mining game. We've got a missions game that's basically um, gamified staking. So you go on a mission and you, you know, when it comes back, you've, you've accrued some more Trillium. And we got, of course, more games on the roadmap. That's really interesting. So is that sort of like a quadratic voting yeah. sort of structure with with uh, stakers essentially having more weight when they participate in a syndicate vote? Yeah. So if if I've got 10 trillion and you've got 100, right? And we're both voting on our candidate. And I want my candidate to win. If I'm willing to stake my trillion for longer than you, then I can balance out, right? The power of my vote with your economic advantage or mine. So it's a way to kind of even things out and create more parity in elections. Because otherwise, obviously, the power pools very quickly in any economy, if there's no design in place to kind of like offset the disadvantages. Mm -hmm. And are you noticing that there are trillium whales that are in the game? Is it from, and if they are, if they do exist, is it from uh, basically OGs who've been around since day one? Or from maybe someone who bought into the vision of the game and just acquired a ton of Trillium? I think it's mostly the OGs. The people, and we have a loyal group of you know, community of players. And the players include people that really like the mining game, could never afford a piece of land because of where they live in the world, but they, but they enjoy the game. We've got players that enjoy the game because of its lure and its gameplay. And we're an indie game, and there's um, an attachment to us because of that. And we've been around for a while and we haven't done a rug pull. We're imperfect, but we're, we're doing our best. And I, I definitely feel like our community gives us the benefit of the doubt. And then we have people that have been around for a while and have crewed quite a bit of Trillium. So, and, and some of them have figured out, you know, like earlier on, how to take advantage of, of some things before we had the economy totally balanced out. And that's fine. So now I've got this sort of economy with a few big holders and many smaller holders. And so for me, since we just got, you know, as a product person, like since we just got these DAOs in place, and I know the people that are running in the DAOs, for the most part, they, they're builders. They really want to do creative things. That's why they're involved in the game. That's why, they, you know, they're OGs and they, they've got, you know, stockpiles of trillium because they've been here for a while and they are innovators. And so, and I think they want to build these great cultures. So, we're looking at products and structures to connect them to the smaller trillion, like to, to make sure that it's one community. So like, how can the DAOs fund activities, get connected to the gameplay of people doing mining games or missions or whatever games we come forward with next? We've also got grants going out to um, teams and programmers to build their own games on our ecosystem. We're very open architecture on the back end. We're, we're writing documentation. The grant program is called G-Hubs. And so one thing, we, we're we not like a stovepipe product. We're an open metaverse. And that means it's really significant in the, all of the, the ways that we're open, especially in the smart contract level. So we have people building their own games using our NFTs and our Trillium against our smart contracts. And they're part of this ecosystem. That's really cool. I just went all over the place, man. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's totally fine. I also wanted to just give your team kudos on the lore because uh, I really enjoyed watching the videos, especially like the update videos. And I got like, a, I don't know if you remember the movie Starship Troopers. Oh, yeah. I loved it. Yeah. I got like a vibe of <laughs> like the Starship Troopers when they would have the news scenes. That's kind of the vibe I got with like the lore updates um, that Alien Worlds put out. So that was really fun. So if any of your content creators or lore builders are listening to this, kudos. Well, our CMO will be very happy to hear that. The lore is his passion project. He's brought so much energy into the company. He's really infused us with a passion for storytelling. The founders gave us great building blocks with these planets, with the races and the weapons, and the, the backstory. And uh, with his help, we're bringing some of those stories forward. And our community is doing a great job of bringing the story forward, too. What's your CMO's name? Kevin Rose. Shout out to Kevin. Shout out to Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> so you've mentioned uh, a couple times in our discussion that there are multiple DAOs that are in alien worlds. So mm -hmm. are these multiple DAOs just that there are six planets and there are six syndicates? And so there are six different DAOs that you get to vote on? Or 
Is it that the voting for a syndicate leader is just one of the types of DAOs and maybe another is like the direction that like I can vote on where I want the storyline to go? That is a great question and one that Kevin would have loved to hear you ask. Right now, the, you know, we, we released the DAO tech in October and we've done probably four different minor upgrades. And what we're doing now, the first thing we could do is enable the payment for projects, right? So once you're voted into a DAO, you can vote, the vote passes. And the basic proposal is we're going to pay somebody you know, from our treasury. And, and the game funds the treasury, right? So the DAO has access to a treasury and then they pay for projects. We had one of our planetary DAOs by advertising on the Las Vegas Strip. They do different, they fund different creative projects. They really got great ideas, right? So that's the kind of projects they fund. Right now, we are innovating in the space of new proposal types. So like, is there something we can build on chain to help a DAO promote itself? Is there something we can do on chain to be a new proposal type to help a DAO in a trustless environment, you know, accept and manage a project? Is there something we can do on chain for a DAO to accept referendum from the explorers on that planet that don't have the authority of being a custodian? So like there's, we have a backlog of ways to enable the DAOs to do more. What the idea, your specific idea for managing and controlling the lore is something we're very interested in. You know, we've got a lot of great creative contributions, technical contributions, art contributions and storyline contributions, game storyline combining like our community is just the absolute best. They've, they've run with kind of the building blocks that are out there. And we do see a DAO as an excellent model to decentralize the management of a lower franchise. Like we, we think that, that that's a, that's hasn't been done, that that's something we're very interested in doing. That's something that, as I mentioned, Kevin's very invested in, you know, we, we could build it up and then hand it over as something that's very decentralizable. And actually, you know, hearkening back to our, you know, publishing industry conversation, kind of the opposite of that, right? Where there's a, a gated concept where you could actually turn it over to the people that love it the most, and they will, they'll make it do things that you could never imagine. And we're a small team, right? Without the ideas of our community, I can't do it all by myself. I mean, it, who can? Yeah. So something else I'm really curious to pull your ear on is this open source metaverse. It sounded like if I'm a game dev, I can tap in to alien worlds. What does this look like? Like, can I just come out of nowhere one day and say, here's a seventh planet. I've done all the creative drawings for it. I've brought in my own community. We've already staked Trillium. Like I'm just popping up out of nowhere and I'm ready to integrate my own land into your game. What does that sort of open source metaverse look like? It doesn't look exactly like that because there is a smart contract that governs, you know, what, you know, the container of the Alien Worlds game. And so, and, and a blueprint that we published, we are kind of bound to some constraints, but we do have, you can use our NFTs, you can use our Trillium, and you can use our smart contracts to build your own game. And the G-Hubs grant program will will help guide you to do that. And we're writing documentation now. So we, we want people to build their games. If you want to build a chess game, if you want to build you know, a side scroller, if you want to build a racing game with our NFTs, like whatever, um, let us know. Come to Alien Worlds. We want to hear from you because we, you know, we've talked about people that participate in DAOs. We've talked about people that kind of have a love of forward thinking, like sort of bad UX blockchain games. We're trying to make the UX better, but the mining game is kind of hard to do and it, you got to love what it is to play it. But there's also you know, these builders that is another persona that were really, really important to our community. A lot of those are the same people, actually, they're in the DAOs. They're very technically savvy. So they're already using our smart contracts. We're working really hard on documentation. We're building APIs now this year so that we can really get it out there and, and create a builder's kit for folks. And we, we see that as being a, a key job for us in the space and something we've got permission to do is really help people bring forward their gaming ideas in a crypto space, kind of like an SDK for crypto games. 
Yeah, I'm a big proponent of all of that. In addition to the Smart Economy podcast, I'm also very active in the NEO ecosystem. I'm a member of a community funding DAO, and we've distributed grant funding. I'm very well aware of the importance of documentation and SDKs and providing all this for people to easily build and integrate uh, and iterate on top of what you guys have already created. So to hear uh, grants and micro grants and documentation is music to my ears. What are you envisioning with like maybe if somebody built a, I don't know, Alien World slot machine or Alien World's racing game? Will there be like a portion on the web app that will host kind of like a mini games folder or catch all? Uh, is that kind of what you're envisioning? Oh, yeah. We're building a showcase right now for the projects. We've got one that we published a few months ago and, and we're just about done. But the thing is, the only weird thing is, we've never. We have to put this marketing content. We don't have any marketing content like that. We don't have like a showcase. So we had to figure out a way to do it on chain, right? So like, it's easy to say, oh, we just got to build this website and link out to the project and they can go play that game that the community built. No, we need to build, we need to content manage that web page on chain so that we can eventually turn it over to the DAOs to run themselves. If you build everything to be decentralized, it adds a little bit of overhead, but it also makes it more interesting to do. So, yeah, we'll have a, we're calling it, I believe it'll end up being called the arena. Where we'll have different projects that, that come forward from G hubs and other community projects. Communities do more than gaming too. They, they've given us lore. They've given us gaming ideas. We've got people really excellent, like gaming ideas and art projects. If you follow us on Instagram, the fan art is phenomenal. Like uh, people doing really cool AI stuff, just top notch paintings. It's beautiful. Yeah. And and the artwork for Alien Worlds that your team is responsible for also looks really good. So shout out to that team. Oh, thanks a lot. So like Wax is a very, they're very much going after the gaming space. So I'm curious, what were some of the things you were looking into when choosing which blockchain to build on top of? Well, it's a little bit before my time. I know that, that like Wax was compatible with the EO, EOS experience we had already, and and their focus on gaming. I think that was probably most of it. And when we launched, it offered, I know they offered a good UX for onboarding into a blockchain game at the time. Since then, that hasn't aged particularly well, and so we need to go back through and and take another round at the onboarding experience, which we're doing right now. But Wax is still very dedicated to, to gaming. And there's and the, the tooling is great. They're very flexible. And we know that we're doing things in our game with, with our DAOs would be difficult, if not impossible, on bigger chains. So it's it's a constant trade-off. It's 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 hard. We can do very cool things, but the addressable market is limited. So it's it's a good fit for now for sure. You just mentioned onboarding. And I what's the best way to put this? <laughs> with play to earn games, it seems like you can have very short term oriented individuals who join the ecosystem because they can spin up a wallet, they can onboard, and they can maybe create a bot to script what they do. Or maybe they just show up for a week, click a lot of buttons, get a couple bucks, and then they exit. So when I was looking into onboarding into Alien World, something that I noticed right off the bat is that there's a small upfront fee, around $5 to, to onboard. Is this by design? Or was it something that is kind of required by building on top of the wax chain. What was sort of the thought process that went into making a little bit of a monetary upfront investment into playing the game? That actually comes from wax. And I think that's going to wind up going away like this week or next week. So they've re-architected. And so that, that, that was a result of cost drivers they were experiencing. So that's understandable, but it did create kind of a barrier to entry. Now, of course, that about $5 fee did create some kind of barrier. But you know, I don't think that's the best design to prevent automated account creation. The best way to, in my opinion, in my, the way my team approaches is like, yes, of course, we've got to do things to account for you know people that aren't there to love the game. But the best way to do that is make the game more fun, you know, provide some progression, you know, make it more fun and over time more valuable to stay with one wallet 
keep playing, you accrue things that are associated with that wallet and, and that wallet gains value over time. And you'll give them more fun gamified things to do in the game. So we have to manage for antibody and things like that, but we have to design for people. And kind of if you design for people, generally fun things to do are harder to buy. <laughs> you know, the flatter it is, the easier it is, the more the more depth you create and the more storytelling and, and the more growth and life cycle that you that you enable inside of the game, the better it is for everybody. Absolutely. Kind of wrapping up, I want to hear two perspectives from you. What are you really excited about with the gaming industry and the integration of DAOs and blockchain moving forward? And also, what are you really excited about for Alien Worlds moving forward? Well, I think um, for the gaming industry and all of my gaming experience has been on the last year on the blockchain game. So yeah, um, I think that uh, blockchain offers a lot of utility that even though there is some resistance to some probably, you know, uh, well-funded corner of the industry uh, against it, the use case for having portable assets for to enabling somebody that, you know, plays one version of your game to bring their assets with them to the new version of their game or to sell those assets when they're finished with the game, it's kind of unassailable. Like, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to say that if I buy a truck in your game, I, I don't own it, right? Or whether it goes away, you know, when you turn off your server. So I think that that's one of those things that's just inevitable, kind of with the banking industry too. Like, you know, like ultimately the technology is better, digital rights are better, and traceability and auditability is better, and it'll just be inevitable. So I think it'll happen over time. I think what everybody imagines is these AAA games running on blockchain, and that's not possible now, so it's not good. Well, I mean, there's a guy that was around in the 70s named Bernard Suits, and he was kind of an English, I think, philosopher about gaming, right? And he said, uh, Play a game is a voluntary effort to overcome unnecessary challenges or something like that, right? So like everybody, so that's, if you expand what a game is, right? It can be more than shooting aliens, you know, in a, in a 3D environment. It can be the people that went to the trouble to set up their wallets with alien worlds and wax a year and a half ago were doing a voluntary ep- effort to overcome an unnecessary obstacle because they were interested in it, because it was interesting to them and they wanted to experience it. And that's what, what we're still trying to tap into. The people that are involved in our DAOs today are doing the same thing. They're not getting rich off of it. They're, they're, they're doing it because they're interested in the project, they're invested in the project, and they want to be a part of it. And they, they like, there's a value to them to being part of the community and being involved in, in this big experiment, right? So for me, that's the core of what I'm excited about in terms of blockchain gaming. I'm excited about what we're doing at the Coco. I love what, you know, Splinterlands is doing amazing things. Upland is doing amazing things. You know, a lot of the other companies in OMA3, the sort of alliance that we have of blockchain games, some are great at marketing, some are you know, really incredible at the kind of civilization type game. I think we've, you know, our niche in the open metaverse and the communities that we're building in the DAO space is really powerful. And I like the ability to um, focus on people and the players and the culture that they're bringing forward and to kind of expand what the definition of play is. I mean, the play is voting. The play is getting in, learning about this sort of uh, this startup, this sort of indie project and getting involved. And people really like that. And what we want to do is honor that, nurture that, make it possible to share it with a broader audience. The quote of the fellow from the 70s that you mentioned reminds me, I'm, I'm into rock climbing, and uh, Yvonne Chouinard, who founded Patagonia, calls rock climbers conquistadors of the useless. That's right. <laughs> so while these uh, unnecessary challenges might seem like insignificant to some, to others, they mean the world. So what's the best way that people can keep up with you, with Alien Worlds, or with DeCoco? On Telegram at BT Sullivan. And Alien Worlds is play.alienworlds.io. You can also go to our decoco.io website. We're on 
Twitter, I mean, Twitter and uh, Instagram. It's probably the best place to follow us for, for news. You know, we have things going on every week. The market, you know, the communities team do a great, great job. We're on Reddit. We're a global game. And so we're, we're in most markets and we've got a pretty great community team. So we're pretty easy to find. Awesome. Well, to anyone listening, go check out any of those social media resources to onboard yourself into Alien Worlds. Brendan, thank you so much for sharing an hour with me today. It was really cool to hear your background, what gets you really excited about DAOs and gaming and just your psych for this new, innovative and ever-changing industry. Thanks, Dylan. It's been a real privilege to represent the team and it's been enjoyable to meet you and uh, share the last hour. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Take care. Well, what did you think of that conversation? I thought it was really cool to hear Brendan's perspective on DAOs serving as a tool and that it is indeed a community that's necessary to leverage these resources. It was also interesting to hear how DeCoco seeks to build upon the active environments of passionate gamers and tap into their desires to collaborate with one another through DAO tooling. Looking forward, it'll be interesting to see how the open source ecosystem supports new additions to the game that are delivered from its builder-oriented community. On that note, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the Smart Economy podcast. If you liked what you heard and want to support the show, please keep Neo News Today in mind when voting for your Neo Council representative as part of Neo's governance process. We appreciate you and look forward to catching you next time.